Let the party begin. Your healthy radio addiction starts now. Motorcycle Madhouse on Spotify and iTunes Radio. And welcome to this edition of Motorcycle Madhouse. Boy, do we got a show for you today. We have special guests Bob and Ryan coming up later on from the Bob and Ryan Show. They are a new group that is starting up some great uh, content online. They are funny as heck. Man, let me tell you, we're going to be talking about uh, all kinds of stuff that has to do with Harley. They are actually salesmen down at a Harley dealership in Florida. We'll be talking about Livewire, their uh, program for new riders the whole nine yards so that is coming to you and uh, also we have uh, a lot of material that we're going to dive into especially that has to do with the secret society of police out in Los Angeles it is just coming out that the FBI is investigating this group and they've been around forever forever I guess and this is something the public is just getting to hear now so I'll be going over this news article with you uh, just a lot of stuff going on don't forget to like and subscribe to our channels over on Spotify uh, iTunes all that you to listen to the show there as well as our YouTube and don't forget every uh, Monday through Thursday, we got uh, our daily biker news over on YouTube. But uh, let's get into some stuff right now. Uh, the first thing I want to do is go over this. Before I get into the Secret Society stuff, I want to go over this video that was just released of a police chase, which ended up with him roughing up a biker. And as you know, if you're listening on the radio, you might want to go over to uh, the YouTube channel and listen to the uh, live episode. You'll be able to see uh, what I'm going to do. But I'm going to give a little bit of narrative for the rate for those that listen to us on the radio but uh, right now here's what's going on the, there's a police chase that was initiated and I'm guessing that it has to be speeding or something because when you see this guy he's wearing a backpack and all that kind of stuff and I just cannot take him for uh, doing anything other than speeding because right now you can see Hey, he sees the lights, he's pulling over, and he's on a rocket, and again, he's got the backpack, he's getting off the bike right now, he's doing everything he's supposed to do, he's got his helmet on, uh, yeah, this don't look like no criminal to me, boom, there goes the cop, just smacks him, knocks him over the bike, this kid was cooperating with everything he was supposed to do, and I guarantee this was a speeding type of uh, a deal. Look the way this cop is treating this kid, and people wonder why, you know, there's angst against police officers. Jesus, look at this stuff. So, as you can see, that video was pretty messed up, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, but first... This story is by Joe Rubin, and this is, a, this is messed up. The FBI is investigating a secret society of tattooed deputies in East Los Angeles, as well as similar gang-like groups within the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department. Multiple people familiar with the inquiry said, yes, people, an actual gang within the police department. It goes on to say the federal probe uh, was following allegations of beatings and harassment by members of <laughs> the Banditos, a group of deputies assigned to the Sheriff's Department's East LA station who brand themselves with matching tattoos of a skeleton outfitted with a sombrero and a bandolier and pistol. The clique's members are accused by other deputies 
of using gang-like tactics to recruit young Latino deputies into their fold and retaliating against those who rebuffed them. This is a heck of a story, man. This came out of the LA Times. In interviews with several deputies, FBI agents have asked about the inner workings of the banditos and the group's hierarchy. Yes, there's a hierarchy here. According to three people with close knowledge of the matter who spoke to the Times on the condition that their names not be used because the investigation is ongoing. No, I think, <laughs> I think they're afraid to talk out. In particular, the sources said, agents have been trying to determine whether leaders of the banditos require or encourage aspiring members to commit criminal acts. Now these are people with badges, such as planning evidence or writing false incident reports to secure membership in the group. And you got people out there talking about one percenter clubs? The agents also have re uh, inquired about other groups known to exist in the department which has nearly 10,000 deputies and polices large swaths of the sprawling county. This ain't the only one they're investigating. They have asked for information about the tattoos and practices of the Spartans and regulators in the department's central station and the Reapers. There's all kinds of gangs within the Blue Gang who operate out of a station in South Los Angeles, and this according to the sources. Yes, did you guys know about this? You guys wonder why I got attitudes towards them. Sheriff Alexa Vanilla said he could not comment when asked about the FBI probe Wednesday. It's probably because he's one of them. And an FBI spokeswoman also declined to provide any information. This is some serious stuff coming out. The inquiry marks the return of federal law enforcement authorities tasked with digging around in the sheriff's department, which has been beset by episodes of corruption and mismanagement in the last several years. <laughs> oh, wow. In 2011, the FBI secretly opened an investigation into reports of inmate abuse by deputies working in the county jails. The sweeping probe involving an inmate who served as an undercover informant upended the insular department, sending several deputies to prison for beatings and cover-ups. Former Sheriff Lee Baca, his second-in-command, and other senior staff were convicted of conspiring to obstruct the FBI. And I got another story coming up after this one, but this is one of my personal ones that go to this. The current investigation appears to have been spurred by a group of deputies who in March filed a legal claim against the county accusing Sheriff's Department officials of failing to address a hostile work environment in the East LA station. You think it's a gang within the freaking blue gang? They say uh, deputies, uh, banditos leaders who are alleged to control key elements of station operations, this goes all the way up, puts others' lives at risk by not sending backup to help on dangerous calls, enforced illegal arrest quotas, and carried out other forms of harassment. This can go all the way up to the station chief's level, guys. The claim, a precursor to a lawsuit, focuses on deputies that they say was unprovoked attack by members of the banditos during an off-duty party in the early mornings of September 28th at Kennedy Hall, an event space near the station. And again, this ain't regular folks making these accusations. These are cops. The altercation started with 
uh, when four banditos began arresting a, uh, harassing a rookie, according to the claim, two other deputies said they had intervened. One was struck repeatedly in the face, while the other was punched and kicked multiple times before being choked and losing consciousness, the claim says. These are police officers. Sounds like a gang activity right there, don't it? The lawman accused in the claim, deputies David Silverio, Gregory Rodriguez, and Rafael uh, uh, Munez, and Sergeant Mike Hernandez were placed on paid administrative leave after the incident. So you know what happened. The sheriff's uh, department presented a criminal case involving the four men to the district's attorney's office on June 19th. So maybe they're starting to clear out their ranks of uh, corruption. I don't know. Greg uh, Rizlin, a spokesman for the district attorney's office, said Wednesday that charges have not been filed and that the case remains under review. Hmm. He declined to comment when asked whether uh, federal officials have asked his office to hold off on prosecution. So you got the feds coming in here. You got the states coming in here. Oh, my God. Uh, they go on as uh, saying uh, the chief has repeatedly downplayed the significance of tattooed deputy groups in his ranks. Of course they will. Calling them a cultural norm and a source of inter, uh, intergenerational hazing among lawmen. That is the biggest BS I ever heard. He said there is nothing wrong with the clubs as long as they don't promote misconduct. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. Still, he acknowledged the persuasive influence of the banditos at the East LA station, saying they ran roughshod over the previous captain and dictated where deputies would be assigned. Enabled by the weak leadership of past administrations. That's because he were probably a part of it. He said that his first act upon taking office December 3rd was to bring in a new captain, Ernie Chavez, to quell the bandito situation. How do you quell it? Fire them. The law enforcement officers. Chavez identified the problem and the problem players, and he's doing a commendable job of sifting through them to get the station up and running to serve the community. Yeah, whatever happened to protect and serve people? What happened to it? These are your police officers. Last month, he announced a new policy that specifically bars department members from participating in any groups that promote conduct that violates the rights of other employees or the public. Does that include Leo Motorcycle Clubs? Just wondering. The policy says such groups often organize under a symbol or tattoo and increase the risk of civil liability to the agency. Again, I'd like to know if it goes to Leo Clubs. He said the First Amendment prevents him from barring deputies from getting tattooed, but he has said having matching ink is a dumb ideal because of potential lawsuits in today's litigation society. Really? He blames it on that. He advises those with the coordinated tattoos to get them removed if they can. The sheriff, no, they want to cover it up is what they want to do. The sheriff claims he transferred from the station 36 people who were associated with the banditos or were otherwise identified as problematic. <laughs> but Chavez in an interview Wednesday said that the 36 transfers simply reflect the general group of deputies who left the station since January and that the departures were voluntary. You know what? Who believes that? Come on. He goes on to say some because of promotions. He said he did not know how many people uh, allegedly tied to the banditos were transferred. How do you even have that type of group within the police? 
And you wonder why people say Blue Gang? He said he no longer thinks it's a hostile environment at the East LA station. Now, and he goes on to say, now that it's been broken up and scattered, I'd say, yeah, it's over, he said. No, it's over because you want to get out there out in front of that FBI investigation. Vincent Miller, an attorney for the deputies who filed the claim about the banditos, said any changes at the station have been cosmetic and have failed to abolish the toxic work environment there. He said the department has not held the problematic deputies accountable. Of course not. They're not going to turn on their own people. That's that the blue wall. And that some of his clients have suffered ongoing emotional stress because of the situation, prompting him to file additional grievances in the case. And you guys got to remember who out live out there, this is your tax dollars, man. You're going to work every day to pay these people. The captain and everyone else at the East LA station knows they haven't transferred 36 deputies, and the real number is just six. Miller said, we specifically filed the supplemental claims very recently because the cop gang problem, now this is a cop gang problem, has not been fixed. Now there's attorneys and everybody saying there's a gang problem within the cop department. <laughs> Jesus, man. People wake up. That's why I get so Dang irritated when you got people, oh, there's good cops, there's bad cops. That might be the case, but you people do not under the, understand the street. They don't understand the underworld. This is what happens, man. People are so naive. It's freaking, it's sickening. Now you have, this has been going on for years years and finally how many people that were sent to prison doing hardcore time because of these people might have had evidence planted or might have had a, you know what i guarantee that these cops were making money on the side they always do it's known on the street if you're running the game you're paying the cops just so you to stay out of jail so I'm, uh, you get sick of hearing this goody two-shoes stuff about cops. You really do. That's just like when I seen a one video. It was titled Motorcycle Club Infiltration. And, they, and the guy goes on talking this and that. But there's a couple things that really got to me in that video. Because I was around during that time. He was talking about the Chicago Confederation of Clubs. They were openly talking about illegal stuff in the confederation you're kidding me right you really are and if you're watching this you're kidding me do you think now there has to be over 20 clubs at that time in that confederation do you think people are going to openly talk about criminal stuff in front of people they don't know or do you think people are going to buy that <laughs> You're, you're kidding me, right? Openly talking about this. And for those that don't know about NCOM or Confederation of Clubs, they have attorneys there during the meetings. Because they discuss issues about bars not letting them in there with the patches and stuff. But they got attorneys sitting in there. So do you really think that people are going to talk about criminal activity in front of an attorney and an attorney's going to sit there and let it happen? Come on, man. That's messed up. And then the story about 9-11. Where do you get off? Really, where do you get off? Saying that members of a charter were trying to make money off the dead from 9-11? Now that's some cop freaking propaganda crap right there, man. Where the hell are you coming from with that kind of stuff, man? Really? He claims that they're trying to make money off the bodies of the 9-11 victims. You're crazy, man. You're already in a minute to undercover cop. So people are supposed to believe that? 
And you wonder why people can, you know what, especially my generation, because these new jacks are a lot different nowadays. They'll buy anything that you guys are pushing. But the older guys know just exactly what it's about. The guys that grew up on the streets know exactly what it's about. To push that kind of stuff, you are out of your damn mind. And here you are given tips on how to steal motorcycles. You're given tips on cops infiltrating. What is going what's going through your mind, man? Are you crazy? You're nuts. Not only do you have to worry about the clubs on the street, but uh, looks like you're going to have to worry about your own now because you're giving away all the stuff. They're probably shaking their head going, what the hell are you doing? It's, uh, it's unreal, the stuff that was put out in that video. And another thing, talks about Melrose Park. Now, see, uh, Melrose Park gets a whole... Uh, if you don't know the neighborhood, then, you know, you don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, he goes on to say a club from that area was working both sides of the aisle because there was cops in that club. They were working with, uh, like, a double agent type of deal. While they were feeding the club one thing and telling the others the other thing. You, you know what? I knew some of the people in that club, and you're full of, sh you're full of crap. You really are. You really think they would? Nobody would have found out about that kind of stuff, because so many cops on Melrose Park are on the payroll of so many damn people. You do not think that somebody would have found out about that? If you guys don't believe me, look up Melrose Park, man, and all the indictments that always come down over there. The cops are the number one gangsters in Melrose Park. Why do you think uh, it's controlled the way it is? But to go out there and say that, hey, this is what happened. Uh, they were given information here and information there. You're full of crap, man. And again, you don't think anybody would have found out. You know, I know the rant going off the subject a little bit. But when you hear that kind of video and then you hear this kind of stuff that is going on within a police. You got cops afraid of cops. And then you got people out there preaching about how law enforcement's the best. Wake up, man. Are you... Uh, don't be so stupid. Yeah, there's good cops. And it sounds like there's good cops in this story that's trying to bring this stuff down. But you actually got deputies afraid for their lives? Because you got others that are a gang within the police department. And now you got to worry how many people, how many people are sitting in the joint because of this? I, I, you know what? I'm really looking forward to learning how this all pans out. Because you, you take six cops. Say they frame 30 freaking people. Each. That's what, 180 people sitting in prison? How many are going to be released? And then how many more? Because of the corruption. Going back to that one video. I guarantee you that it had... You know what? And we're actually looking into this on Insane Throttle. That the kid was probably speeding. Speeding. And he gets treated like that? He had his hands up when he got off the bike. But no. As soon as the cop got out, he bum rushes him. Knocks him over the bike, all that kind of stuff. Has gun out the whole nine yards. Kid has a backpack. It looks like he's a college kid. So, I bum on cops a lot. Yeah, because I grew up and seen it, man. I seen cops taking four or five hundred dollars a week from people. Four or five hundred dollars a week was to go and rate down in Chicago. Yeah, they made some good uh, freaking bonuses, but it wasn't from you guys. It was off the street, man. And you know what? That's the way the stuff operates. I get that. But don't you dare go out there and say cops don't have nothing on their hands. Uh-uh. Don't you dare put them on a pedestal. You know, that's messed up when you do that. When you see this coming out day after day after day, 
I could pull stories and put it up on an insane throttle every single day of what a cop is doing wrong, but you guys go after one percenter clubs? And your excuses, well, we got more and that's why it looks bad. No, it, hell no, man. You go over there, you take an oath to serve and protect the community, to uphold the Constitution of the United States, and here you guys are doing your thing because you got a tin badge thinking that you're above everybody else. Well, I'm telling you what, you're not. And that's why you see in modern time people are getting sick of it. That's why you see cops going down all the time. Because, you know what, you're just a man or you're just a woman and you put your pants on just like the rest of us. Only difference is you went through a police academy and you got a badge and you figure you got some power. Any of you cops that are, because I know you cops watch me all the time because you cry and whine to me in emails all the time. You're going to tell me, well, I don't care if that kid robbed somebody. He got off of that bike, put his hands up, and he got bum rushed like that? And you wonder why freaking people put the boots to you guys? It's supposed to start with you guys. Do you want everything to start going uh, good on the streets? Then start with yourselves. Start looking in the mirror. Because it ain't, it sure the heck ain't the people on the streets, the civilians that do this stuff. No, you overreact. You ever notice when you get pulled over how much of a crap dick these people are to you? They got these attitudes. So, messed up, man. And again... We're going to be following this story out uh, in uh, East uh, Los Angeles. And uh, again, they got uh, different groups. They got regulators. They got Who do you guys think you are? Really? How do you even look at yourselves in the mirror? You're either a cop or you're not. And that's the problem I always had with Leos. I don't mind if you ride it. I don't mind if you have freaking uh, riding clubs. I don't care. But when you go out there and you try to mirror somebody that you're supposed to be against, you're the biggest hypocrites I've ever met. And the biggest wannabes I've ever seen. I don't see how you guys look in the mirror, man. I really don't. Is, it, is your life that boring or that bad that you got to be something you're not? Sure, if you enjoy motorcycles, hey, more power to you, you're on two wheels. I won't have a beer with you, I won't talk to you, but hey, do your thing. But when you guys do this kind of stuff, man, you wonder why the public's uh, mess with you. Anyway, after the commercial break, we are going to go to our special guest. These guys are funny. You got to love them, man. Uh, I'll be right back. And you can actually find uh, the Bob and Ryan show right in the description box. Go over and check them out. But uh, we'll be right back. May I have your attention, please? Need your daily dose of biker news? Then what are you waiting for? Visit HarleyLiberty.com and keep up to date with all the happenings in the biker scene. And wait! There's more. Insane Throttle Biker News is now on Instagram. Come on over and give us a follow and get special video content not seen elsewhere on the net. Just type in Insane Throttle Biker News in the search bar. In your face, all over the place. We're online 24-7, 24-7. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The most listened to radio show on the planet. Even the other stations are tuned in too. Oh, it's Motorcycle Madhouse on Spotify and iTunes Radio. And welcome back. We have Bob and Ryan from the Bob and Ryan Show. If you guys haven't uh, been seeing some of the trailers of these guys, they are hilarious. And you know, it takes a lot to get me to laugh. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what uh, they got coming up. And uh, today, we're actually going to interview them and find out what they got going on. But right now, we're going to welcome Bob and Ryan to the Madhouse. What's up, 
up, guys? How you doing? What? Thanks, man. Going on, man? Oh, not much, man. Hey, you know what? I was uh, I was gonna tell the freaking story uh, to the audience. Here I am trying to call them. I'm going back and forth. Uh, I didn't know you guys were actually sales and not service, man. <laughs> Yeah, we sell the motorcycle, man. We uh, pedal the iron, you know what I'm saying? Rock and roll, man. Uh, tell everybody about that. You know, you're going to be worldwide here, so tell everybody about uh, what your show's about, what you guys do, how you got into the game, all that good stuff. Thanks, man. I, again, appreciate you having us on. So um, uh, I've been around for like 100 years. I've probably sold the first Harley Davidson ever around. Ryan's been in it a couple years, and uh, here in our dealership, uh, we uh, in the state of Florida, you uh, you have to have a motorcycle endorsement, and you have to go through a class, and that's how kind of me and Ryan started this whole thing. Because man, when when you walk in, you're kind of intimidated, you know, you're trying to learn to ride. So they put us in the learn to ride program, and we tried to make it kind of fun and ease their uh, tension and all that. So. We we uh we kind of started some shenanigans yeah and uh and it just popped up when we started introducing ourselves as the Bob and Ryan show and man it took off from there yeah I'm telling you oh, oh you know what man is it the Ryan and Bob show which one is it <laughs> but that's a great thing I'm that... gonna go ahead and say it. go ahead now wait just a minute bro <laughs> <laughs> no, we keep it kind of like. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and uh, we uh, we're uh, got some really crazy shenanigans coming up because Harley's going through some big changes, and oh, yeah. uh, we're looking forward to it, man, for sure. Absolutely. What changes is uh, Harley Davidson going through? I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, first off, what dealership do you work out of? And uh, again, second, uh, now that you brought that up, it seems like Harley Davidson's having a hard go at it, man. Um, we work at Adamac Harley Davidson, and uh, we were at the Bay Meadows location in Jacksonville, Florida. So moving forward, Harley's coming out with some pretty cool stuff. Uh, me and Bob, actually, we were just up at the factory. There's a lot of stuff we can't talk about that uh, hasn't been released yet. But one of the biggest things that we learned when we were up there is the new live wire coming out next month. Mm. That's the electric bike. Right. Uh, now, yeah. did you guys get... Did you guys get familiar with the live wire? Can you tell us about that one? Because there's a lot of controversy over that live wire. Yeah, absolutely. So Harley's kind of looking at, uh, right now, the biggest competitor um, is the Zero Bike for the, for the electric. Um, so now that's kind of a smaller company. They've been about, around about 10 years, I believe. Um, so Harley's coming out with 1,600 electric bikes, which should double... Zero's market in a, in a year. That's kind of what they're looking at doing, kind of trying to bring other people into the Harley community. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. People who really haven't ridden a big bike, kind of a way to draw them in and, and get them in the Harley lifestyle. Yeah, Hollywood, this is this is not your Pawpaw's Harley, man. It's not going to be for the old school guys that uh, want the uh, want the old uh, Harley style with the loud noise. This is going to bring some, uh, some new people into the sport and to the into the culture for sure right well you know what i'm an older guy man i'm like uh, you know 46 right now and even i look forward to the electric bikes and a lot of my audience are going to kick me in the nuts for that one but uh, i'm a big fan of the zero because of its longevity as far as mileage without you know then going to recharge how is harley going to catch up with the zero as far as uh, mileage is concerned um well, the mileage city is 140 miles on the new live wire coming out. Mm -hmm. So now bet between highway and, and city, they advertise it um, as 110 because that's, you know, Harley's doing a fair thing. They're not going to promote it as 140 and then it comes out and it's not, you know, if you're doing a mix of city and highway. But highway is 140, which is right up there with the zero. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, if you got the extra pack, I think uh, zero goes in the three hundreds or something like that. If I'm correct, so I'm wondering I don't if, know if, if that high. So I'm Down wondering if Harley's going to come out with an extra, you know, battery charger pack for it. Yeah, there's a, there on some of the zeros. There's an extra pack for it. Yeah. In Hollywood, this is really not going to be a long distance 
bike, man. It's it's really designed for urban riding. Yeah. Um, and there's going to be charging stations all over. You can charge it with a regular outlet. It's man, it's just going to be really cool. It's going to be really different. And you know, nobody's really uh, in in the human race is is adaptable to change sometimes. And you're just going to have to keep an open mind about it. But I'm telling you, when you get to ride it, it's going to blow you away. Oh yeah. Right. Well, you know what? I'm 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 actually really excited about it. Again, my listeners are going to kick me in the head, but uh, you know, I believe if Harley Davidson was able to lay the infrastructure for you know the charging stations from dealership to dealership, uh, I think it would be a fantastic thing. And electric, especially with the gas prices in Illinois, man, they just kicked us in the balls with it. And I know Cali is up to almost five bucks a gallon. So something like this would be phenomenal if it took off. Oh, yeah. And the live wire is just the first bike. I think, uh, you know, probably later on you're going to see a lot more from Harley Davidson, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. I would uh, anticipate that. Mm. Well, you know, you guys said that you were, you know, your show's gonna, uh, you guys are funny as hell, let me put it like that, man, you guys remind me of Catfish, uh, I don't know if you guys know who Catfish <laughs> is, but, uh, he, you know what, he's a funny guy, and you guys bring, uh, a different type of, uh, feel to, uh, the online content, you know, my stuff is, you know, usually serious, and I'm always reporting on the bad stuff going on there, and fighting for uh, profiling rights and stuff, but you guys really bring it for the independent biker. What uh, is the makeup? You know, it's not only, you know, I'm old now. It's not only our uh, generation anymore, but you got a totally different generation of biker coming in now. Yeah, absolutely. What's the makeup that you've been seeing? I think right now we put about 3,000 uh, new riders through our Learn to Ride program here uh, in our dealership. A really high percentage are women, and the other high percentage is men, the 20-year-old to the 30-year-old, which, man, we have to have in our sport to be able to survive. You've got to bring the next generation in. So we try and relate to them. We keep it light. We don't ever rehearse anything. We just kind of bounce crazy shit off each other. And yeah. Ooh, sorry, it, man. sorry, I shouldn't have said that. But. Well, you can, uh, man. Yeah, man. This is don't worry about it. Go ahead. <laughs> You're talking to bikers, yeah, man. You just swear. <laughs> just sit around and we'll be like, hey, let's do this. All right, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of feed off each other. You know, it's a good time. How's the dealership uh, think of your show, man? Uh, they like it. They actually, uh, we we used to do the videos just kind of for the staff, and we wouldn't, you know, pr- you know, publish anything, uh, obviously. And then our, our marketing director one day said, hey, why don't you guys do a video about this? And then, okay, and then we had the Ives brothers out here, and they said, go do a video about the Ives brothers, you know, the, the Wall of Death guys. So, mm-hmm. and it just, yeah, it just kind of snowballed from here. Right. From there, you know. Do you guys uh, go out to the, any of the rallies now? Typically, when the rallies, we're really close to Daytona, one of the largest, you know, bike rallies twice a year in, in the United States. But, uh, man, we're really busy at that time. And like I mentioned, we're, uh, uh, you know, kind of our first priority is to, to pedal some iron and to sell some motorcycles. So we're usually working around that time. Absolutely. We have opposite schedules, too. So, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, we have to squeeze in uh, when we're both here and uh, got a couple of minutes to spare, you know. Right. What uh, is the future hold for the show, man? You know, I think it's taken off really good, man, if you guys keep up at it. We appreciate that, man, and thank you again for the exposure. Uh, We're getting ready to set up a YouTube page, so what we'd like to do is uh, send you that link. If you could forward that to your audience, we could could use some more followers. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know what I'll do, man, is I'm going to have to get you on... uh, you know, see if Good Time Charlie over at BIC would give you an interview. I'll talk to BD. Uh, he, we'll get it out there for you because you guys are funny as hell, man. You guys bring a di- different atmosphere to a lot of what, again, what we have to cover and stuff like that. So it's always fun watching you guys. You know, you guys remind me of, again, Catfish. 
<laughs> but it would be cool to see you guys really take off and uh, really run with it because the more biker content we have, the better. Absolutely. 100%, man. 100%. We're totally on board on that, for sure. Rock and roll, man. So you said uh, Harley is going to be, uh, I know they had like a, what, 100 uh, different model go. What, why do you think it took them so long to come out with the different lines compared to what they used to come out with? You know, it used to be, you know, sporty, soft tail, all that good stuff. But now they're really coming out with different lines. Yeah, you know, that, that's a good question, Hollywood. I'm not really sure, man. You know, we're, we're kind of at the dealer level, dealer level, so we're not really privy to a lot of that stuff. Um, but like I said, I, I think, this is just my opinion, you know, not any official word, but I think that the kind of, the different models they're coming out with is to kind of get the younger generation on two wheels. And I really think that that's, that's kind of their goal, is to, is to keep the tradition going and bring as many people into the Harley culture as possible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. What do you think? Uh, okay, you're in the dealership level. What's the difference between the generational gap? You know, we uh, you, we we usually bump on millennials all the time and stuff like that. What's the different characteristics that you see from our generation at ours as far as you know riding and stuff like that? Main thing to me is quantity. You know, the, the younger generation, man, they don't, uh, they weren't like us. They didn't go outside and play every day, man. They're, they're a lot of them are uh, techies and they're gadget guys and they're game players. And um, uh, you, you just got to work it, man. You got to get them in the dealership. On our level, we got to do everything we can to try and get them here and get them interested in our culture. One. Because it's a very cool culture. The, the Harley is a little bit different than anything else out there. We have all kinds of events just about every week trying to draw a crowd and then, man, work them into uh, riding a motorcycle. Yeah, and getting them on two wheels, man. That's that's the goal, mm -hmm. to, to spread the Harley love and culture as far as we can, you know. Do you think... Uh what Harley's goal should be is to get more technological with their uh, bikes that they have, you know, they haven't been that much in the past, so you think that's what's going to grab these young kids? Well, the live wire, man, let me tell you, that thing is loaded with technology. It, it's got some some <laughs> some pretty serious technological stuff in it, man. We uh, we got to ride it and learn learn quite a bit about it. So I think that that's going to be huge to draw, you know, the kind of more techie people, the software developers, stuff like that, to get them into the Harley lifestyle. And that technology also, we, we're assuming, is going to roll over into the, the normal touring bikes and soft tails and, and sportsters as well, which, uh, again, is going to be a key part to their growth, I think, uh, and that's what their five-year plan is, I would imagine. Yeah. What is that? you got to the deal level. Have you guys heard the rumor about getting rid of the Sportster line? Uh, yeah, we hear a lot of that kind of stuff every day. I don't, I don't foresee something that Harley's made that long um, them walking away from. I really don't. Mm -hmm. Again, this is just my opinion. I don't yeah. see them doing that. Really Man, we, we hear a lot of rumors from a lot of customers, and nine times out of ten, it's, it's not true. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, we work early, and we don't really know what's going on until until the dealer show every year. And right. Like, wow, okay, they're coming out with this other thing. You know, recently it's been different. They've been kind of, you know, Harley's been showing their hand a little bit with the Street Fighter and then the, uh, the what is it, the off-road bike? Off-road electric bike. Yeah, yeah, the electric bike. So this is the first time they've really done that, but typically we don't even, we work here, man, and the techs or anybody at the dealership, nobody knows until... You know, like three days before the bikes show up at the door, and then it shows up, and everybody stands around it drooling, like, "Wow, look at that!" Yeah, we got we we learn we we gotta we gotta uh, go through some training. We only have about seventy two hours to learn these motor motorcycles before we have to sell them, and they're they're on our sales floor. So now, do you, quite a challenge. you talk about training now? Is that at the regional level, or do they actually send you up to the factory? No, they got they got an online program. So you can look at videos and tests and stuff. Mm -hmm. Harley corporate dealerships. Right, right. 
Well, you know, another amazing fact, uh, again, when I was coming up in the late 80s and 90s, women were, <laughs> it used to be a scene, you know, on the back seat, they didn't ride their own, but uh, I think it's really cool that women are getting into it now. And you guys said that a lot more women are, uh, you know, going in there and doing your learn to ride stuff. What's it like for, uh, you know, uh, just a newbie coming on off the street wanting to get into it, uh, being a female? Most of them are very enthusiastic. And, and like you mentioned, you know, their dads and papas and all them were riders their whole lives, so they have some kind of connection, but they – they come in kind of intimidated and, you know, not sure what's going to happen, but uh, we're pretty good at uh, adapting and making them feel comfortable and making them uh, sure that they're going to be able to ride safe. That's our number one goal. And the second goal is getting them on the right motorcycle. Mm -hmm. What, is, you know, a lot of people don't understand what the Harley's Learn to Ride program's about. Can you talk about the program a little bit for, because I get newbies all the time asking me about this stuff, and I'm always like, go to your local dealership, they'll talk to you about it, because I ain't an expert on that stuff. Uh, I never took a class or any of that stuff, so what's the Learn to Ride program really about? So here at our dealership, uh, so it's done a little bit differently in every state because obviously every state's got different motorcycle licensing laws. But here in our dealership in Jacksonville, Florida, it's typically a three-day course. It's usually a Thursday evening, then all day Saturday, all day Sunday. Now Thursday evening, you're doing book work. You're learning, you know, you're learning at Barney style, as I like to say. You're learning where the clutch is, where the front brake is, where the rear brake is. You're learning, you know, the basic stuff at a very elementary level. Then when you go out you actually get on a bike and you know you start slow walking it in first gear practicing getting it into neutral and then eventually you work your way up to where you actually take a road test in the course and that when you pass the road test you get your certificate for the course and you get your motorcycle endorsement um, and everything you just got to go to the DMV and they give you a, a new license with your endorsement on it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's pretty cool man it's Harley's course is a little bit more challenging than uh, other courses, but it's, it's better for the rider. You know, you're going to learn a lot more through the Harley course than you are from, you know, the guy in the shack behind the mall. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the other thing, Hollywood, is too, man, in 09, they passed this law in the state of Florida. And uh, I'm a 60-year-old guy, man. I never had to do that. In 09, all of a sudden, I had to take a class or for people that are coming in a state that uh, didn't have an endorsement on their license but been riding their whole lives, had to take the course. And I, I've met guys that have been riding their whole lives 40 years or more. Or they came out of our class and said, you know what, Bob, I'm glad I took this because I've been doing a lot of stuff wrong my whole life, and now I can ride a little bit safer. So that's, that's a positive thing for uh our uh, culture for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, do you guys work in conjunction uh, with Abate at all? Because I know that uh, they're real big on uh, motorcycle safety and the legislation and all that stuff. Uh, not here in Jacksonville. Uh, there's a there's a couple of um, I think uh, uh, connections. One of them is Daytona, which is about ninety miles from us. They're pretty big down there, but. Uh, not much of a presence here in Jacksonville that I know of. Mm -hmm. So is the Learn to Ride program, is that a corporate, uh, you know, curriculum that they put together for all the dealerships to go by? It, it depends on the dealership. We, uh, we hire a uh, outside, we outsource it. We supply the bikes, they use our facility. Um, we're building a new place uh, just a little bit south of here, oldest city in America. It's called St. Augustine, Florida. We're going to have uh, a learn to ride course on site uh, along with the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, but here we just facilitate it, and then the course is uh, just a little bit uh, ways away. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been it's a, been quite a success. Like I mentioned before, we put about three thousand students uh, through the course per year. So wow! Now, do you guys? Uh, a couple final questions. Do you guys uh, put them on sporties when they first come in, or what kind of bike you put them on? Uh, they go on the street five hundred. Mm hmm. The uh, the five hundred. Nice little. That's the little one. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah that's the smallest. Nice point. and easy, uh, not intimidating, and you know, uh, it certainly helps someone that's got a pretty short reach as well, which we see obviously, and women have shorter reaches than we do, so yeah. it uh, makes it more comfortable for them too. Mm -hmm. Now, do uh, you know? Final question: uh, Do uh, the five hundred and seven fifties? How are they selling uh, nationwide? Because I know that's stiff competition with Honda, Yamaha, Kawasaki. Uh, that's really not been Harley Davidson's wheelhouse. You know, I know they uh, got fifty percent of the big bike market, but when it comes to you know maybe twelve hundred CCs and below, they're in uh, stiff competition. So, how are those bikes selling? Yeah, you know, it's, it's different for every region. So, at the dealer level, a lot of times we make the mistake thinking in our bubble in our in our area of operation. Um, but we got to remember that Harley's a world market. So if they produce a bike that they send to us, it may not do well here, but they're killing it over in Europe. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Or they're killing it out in California or Chicago. You know, it's it's a world market, and every area has different bikes that sell at different levels. So for us here, the 750s and 500s, they, they sell pretty decently. You know, uh, we don't have too many that are sitting on the shelf for like six, eight months. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they move it supposed to and the price point is you know pretty low too so yeah it's, it's a first step for a lot of people because of the investment and you get a new bike with a two-year unlimited mileage warranty so that's that's another positive too right right well you know what hopefully harley uh kicks up their game and flat track man because they they're gonna smoke a little bit out on that track guys <laughs> you know indian, I feel indian so giving them hell <laughs> You there? Yeah. Yeah, I thought we lost you for a second. No, nah, well, I'm here. What do you guys think about how Indians doing on that track? Who? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know who you're flying. Do you know who he's talking about? I think, I he, I know who that I think he's talking about that jet ski company. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they make snowmobiles, too. Though. Yeah, I think they use a snowmobile engine in everything they make. Rock on, man. <laughs> Well, are you guys going to be doing, uh, before I let you go, are you going to be doing uh, weekly type of deals, or are you just throwing up stuff on YouTube when you get a chance? Uh, when can people look for you? Yeah, we're trying to do it uh, for a show every Friday. Rock every and roll. Friday evening around 7 o'clock. That, that's the goal for now. Awesome. Well, you know, I appreciate having you guys uh, on the show and uh, letting us know what's going on with Harley Davidson and... Again, I hope you guys uh, really start kicking it out there, man. So hopefully we can help you get out there and uh, get the word spread for you. But if you send me the link for the YouTube stuff, I'll get it up in uh, the description for this show. And I'll start uh, hitting you up on uh, our uh, Facebook and all our social media. And if you send me a banner for the show, man, I'll throw it up on our site for you. Thank you so much, man. We love your, your content as well, man. Appreciate what you do and, and promoting motorcycling. That's awesome. Rock on, man. Well, I appreciate having you guys on. All right, man. It's the Bob and Ryan Show. Do it, Hollywood. Do it. <laughs> Rock and roll, man. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Hey, Bob. And that was Bob and Ryan, man. You guys got to go check out their show. I was laughing my ass off. I wish uh, <laughs> a lot of dealerships had uh, sales guys like these, man. They're out there having fun. It's really what the biker community is about is having fun. And I really like uh, how Harley Davidson is getting into this Learn to Ride program. you got to get the next generation of riders into the lifestyle because old guys, you know, there's older guys than me. We're not going to be around forever, man. And we don't want to see this... Uh, lifestyle uh fade out or any of that kind of stuff yeah everybody i love the live wire type of deal i love the electric bike concept you know would i get rid of my 01 fat boy hell no that's always going to be with me uh but i believe the electric concept is the future give it about 10 15 years and if harley davidson starts getting their price points lower i really do believe that it's going to kick off in the urban areas like chicago new york la atlanta 
and uh, places where you really don't have to uh, go that far. But I believe the infrastructure is going to be the biggest key to making electric motorcycles or even electric cars uh, viable for the consumer. You know, can you imagine if they can get it down to where it only takes maybe 10, 15 minutes to put a full charge on a battery? So I think the batteries is what they're trying to work on, but I think the infrastructure right now really needs to be laid out. And with all the dealerships that Harley Davidson has around the country, if they put charging stations in like that and lower that price point, I really do believe they're going to give zero a run for their money. But uh, with that, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and I'll be right back. Hi, this is James Hollywood Machapari, and if you're listening to this, you obviously like podcasts, and you'll probably like music, too. On Spotify, you can listen to all that in one place for free. You don't even need a premium account. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the Motorcycle Madhouse, the one you're listening to right now. On Spotify, you can follow your favorite podcast so you never miss an episode. Download episodes to listen offline whenever you want and wherever you are. Easily share what you're listening to with your friends via Spotify's integrations with social media platforms like Instagram. And just search for Motorcycle Madhouse on the Spotify app. Or browse podcast in the Your Library tab and follow me so you'll never miss an episode of Motorcycle Madhouse. Spotify is the world's leading music streaming platform. And now it can be your go-to podcast too. Hollywood's Motorcycle Madhouse on Spotify and iTunes Radio. Hey, welcome back, everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I can tell already I'm going to be getting a lot of Leo after my butt over on the email and stuff after that first part of the show. <laughs> but don't forget to be watching Biker Angle every morning, Monday through Thursday at 7.30 in the morning. Go over and check out HarleyLiberty.com for all your other biker news stories. We really appreciate having you on next Monday. We will be having another special guest on uh, air as well as China Dow. She's been uh, under the weather the last couple weeks, but she's going to come back to uh, a segment with us and all that good stuff. But uh, again, really appreciate all you guys' support. And uh, you guys have a good week. I'll see you next Monday. Uh, oh, yeah. Don't forget all the moto vlogs at the end of the week.